When it comes to making movies, who do you think has the most knowledge and the most sway in how things are made and what the story's about? If you said the director, you're wrong. Hello folks, welcome back to Stuff I Make Because I'm Bored. My name is Sin and I will be your host and today I want to talk about how movies are made and the nightmare that that has become. Some important caveats right here off the top. A lot of this comes from my personal experience as somebody who works in post-production on films as well as some research, but a lot of this is dramatized conjecture. It will also mostly focus on Hollywood. Phew, now that that's out of the way, I am going to complain for a while. Part one, how are movies made? How are movies made? Like, how? How was it even possible with all those people working together? How was a single Hollywood movie ever finished? Okay, let's back it up. What is a step-by-step of movie production. Well, obviously it starts with an idea. Someone has an idea. Then some writers get together, they write up a script. Then when the script is in a good place, they enlist the help of some visual development artists who are going to work on blocking out what the vibe of the movie will be, from the color schemes to the character designs, locations, that sort of thing. And at the same time, storyboarders get started and make what is essentially a rough animation of the movie. Somewhere around this point, casting goes out to the actors that they want involved, and the film gets sent out into the world, and post-production companies can start bidding on the movie. In this bidding process, post-production companies have an idea of what the scope of the film will be, as well as the general elements needed to be made for it. For example, any creatures that they'll need to add in, CG environments, how many shots will be expected, the timeline, etc. And this is when things start happening more in parallel. On the movie side, the costume department gets to sewing, the set designers get to building, the makeup artists get to making up being artists, actors get to learn their lines, cameras get set up, microphones get rigged, all that good stuff, and they get to shooting the physical film. And on the post-production side, more viz dev artists get to work on working up more detailed concepts for the visual effects that will be seen in the film. Essentially, they're going to work up a mock 3D version of key shots and locations in the final film that the director and their VFX supervisor can criticize and give notes on. Eventually, the physical movie starts being delivered to the post-production crew in batches, and they get to work on implementing the agreed-upon backgrounds in CG creatures and explosions and color corrections and all that other stuff that needs to happen. And then, post-production gives the final shots back to the director, address any remaining notes, the editors slap it together, and voila, bada-bing, bada-boom, you've got a movie. This process is almost the same for animated movies, by the way. Instead of a physical filming, though, they get actors to read their lines and instead deliver that. That's how it works. The script is figured out at the start, post-production companies know exactly how much work they need to do based on the pitch they bid on, and everything works out. In theory. In reality, it's not that simple. The script changes all the time, the scope changes all the time, directors never know what they want till they see it, and nobody thinks ahead. I'm getting ahead of myself. The reason I wanted to make this video is to discuss a growing problem in blockbusters and break it down a little bit to where I think the issues are actually coming from because it's it's a lot and it's complicated and very interwoven. In rough terms, yes, what I just outlined is how films are made, but it's never that smooth. And it's mostly due to part two. Who actually calls the shots? The director is not the person in control of a film. You'd think they would be, right? They're the man in the chair, the overseer. The movie is their vision. But movies are expensive, like very expensive, like a hundred million dollars and more expensive. Barbie was an estimated 145 million dollars just for production. And that's not even counting the estimated 150 million just for marketing. Who has that kind of capital lying around? Who? Corporations, usually. And when corporations get involved, well, They want to make sure that what they're putting their money up against reflects their values, you know? (laughs) So now, instead of the director making the calls, it's the director as well as whatever board members from the funding companies are on board. Sure, Barbie was Greta Gerwig's film. And sure, people may claim she had free reign. But at the end of the day, it's still a Mattel movie. Mattel calls the shots. And if they get brand deals from other companies, like, for example, Barbie's pink... Chevrolet car thingy. I definitely had to look up what kind of car that was. Do you think those sponsors don't get a say in how their products are used? A post-production company may have had all their shots approved by the director, but if Chevrolet makes a comment like, Barbie needs to have seatbelts or else we won't fund the film. Guess what? 
It's back into production to add seat belts to every single shot. So who calls the shots? The original director, sure. The board of directors for the main funding company. The board of directors for many sponsorship slash brand deals that the movie has. And now we have a lot of cooks in the kitchen, which results in script changes, dialogue updates, constant editing changes, scope updates, and it becomes a huge giant mess. But that's only the beginning of the agony. Part three, fix it in post. We have a saying in the VFX world and it goes like this, we'll fix it in post. And I hate this saying. It sends a cold shiver up and down my spine every time. But what exactly is it that's being fixed in post? Well, let's say your lead actor has a tattoo on the inside of their wrist. Everyone knows it's there. They've always had it. If you look up pictures of them, it's right there. But now they're in a movie where the character that they're acting as does not have tattoos. Now a smart person would say, well, before filming the movie, they'll just slap some makeup on it so it doesn't show up on camera. Yeah, that's what you'd hope would happen, right? Nah, they'll fix it in post. You see, makeup artists are unionized. Their time is extremely valuable. You want to spend the least amount of money and time on makeup because that's gonna cost you. And you know who isn't unionized? VFX workers, exactly. So that's who gets the fun job of scrubbing through every single shot in the film, where the actor's wrist is or might be visible and painstakingly, frame by frame, painting out by hand the tattoo. Yeah, it's painful and it gets worse. Let's say your character ends up in fantasy land where all your dreams come true and the lead actress is in a beautiful green gown. But hey, we couldn't build a set for this place because again, the people who make these things are unionized. So you shoot it in front of a green screen. The lead actress in a green dress in front of a green screen. <sighs> I've seen it happen multiple times. Does anyone on a set think one step ahead, even a single one? What happened to meticulous directors who knew everything about everything? What happened to directors listening to their crew and doing a new take when it's needed because the sound quality sucks? Because the lighting was inconsistent between takes. That makeup is needed to cover that goddamn tattoo. But no, none of that matters because they can fix it in post. And instead of post-production companies going, what the f is this? Why did you shoot the actress in green in front of a green screen? The post-production companies have to say, yes, master, of course, master, anything you say, master. Because if they talk back or give lip or refuse, they lose the client. Hell. This is hell. And then you get assholes like Mr. For Crowlin claiming that his movie has no VFX. Shut up. Yes, it does. Maybe your dumb movie has all practical effects, which, hey, that's awesome. Can't knock that. We love practical effects. But there's still VFX in the movie. A company did the beautifying passes. A company made sure that the head from take three is cut and pasted onto the body of take four. You are a liar. No one knows what's going on anymore. You have no clue what is and isn't real in a movie anymore. Did you think I was kidding about those Frankenstein takes? By the way, lol. Lamau, even. No, I am not. Sometimes a director will say, I like the way their arm moves in this take, but I like the way their torso and head moves in this other take. And so a post-production company will need to Frankenstein those two together. Oh, these actors are interacting with this flying creature, right? Well, they may have had a little stand-in little bobble thing that they were looking at on the physical set for the actor's eyes to follow, but in post, they changed the actual flying path of the creature. Well, someone has to make sure that the eyes of the actors are actually following the fake thing, don't they? So much more of movies is fake than you think it is. And it is truly horrifying. And that doesn't even begin to cover the communication problems. Oh. Part four. Who gave that note? The director theoretically calls the shots, right? Well, they're busy with the editors and the writers and the actors and doing all of that nonsense. So who actually talks to the often several post-production companies to give them directions? That would be the director's right-hand lackey, their VFX soup. So the director tells the VFX soup what they want, right? Which in itself is often also what the board of director of the sponsors want, remember? 
Then, the VFX soup tells the post-production VFX soup what the director said they wanted, but it's filtered through what the VFX soup also thinks the director wants. Then, the post-production VFX soup talks to the other post-production soups, like the CG soup, the anim soup, etc., to tell them what their interpretations of the interpretations of the director's directions are. Then those soups talk to their department leads to tell them what their interpretation of the post-prod VFX soup's interpretation of the VFX soup's interpretation of the director's directions are, which are in and of themselves interpretations of what the sponsors and board of directors want and... <laughs> and then those leads need to brief their artists. It's like the longest game of telephone of all time. Granted, this specific order of operations will depend on what company you're working with and what their workflow is. It's different for every company that I've worked at. But still, sometimes the jobs are even outsourced from the post-production company to a different company if they end up with too much work. So now you're adding a whole nother company into the mix <laughs> with their own workflow. It is an absolute miracle that movies are ever finished, like ever. In conclusion, I don't have a good way to close this rant. Movies are made with such tight deadlines, such high expectations, so much money gets thrown at them that honestly is not needed. It doesn't need to be thrown in. If schedules were longer, if more care was taken in the initial filming, if less people had their meddling hands in the bloody script, the whole thing could be streamlined. I genuinely think fix it in post is killing the movie industry. We wouldn't need to fix the tattoo in post if you took four seconds to fix that before filming. We wouldn't need to fix the hair in post if you had just given your stylists more time to properly adhere the wigs. Not every background needs to be CG. Sometimes a matte painting will do. Not every take needs to be Frankenstein from other takes. Just reshoot the f***ing shot. Please! <sighs> and I didn't even talk about movie revenue or costs in general. That's an entirely different, connected, beast that I don't even want to get started on right now, by gods. I really want to talk about the SAG-AFTRA and WGA strikes, but to do that, I need to cover an enormous amount of groundwork to properly explain why people are striking, beyond just they're not getting paid what they're worth, which they aren't, by the way. I mentioned that VFX companies aren't unionized, so let's expand on that a little bit more. Most of the front-end crew in films are unionized, meaning they are expensive. VFX companies are not unionized. They are cheap. So instead of spending more money to get people to fix simple mistakes in pre-production, they'll fix it in post. If you ask me, they end up spending far more money this way. But hey, what do I know? What are your thoughts on the SAG WGA strikes? Do you have any questions for me that you want me to do some research on? Am I doing all right? Nope. Let me know in the comments. Thanks for spending some time with me. If you thought it was time well spent, leave a like. Subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future. I post videos every Tuesday at noon Eastern. If you want to hear from me more frequently, and if you'd like sneak peeks into future videos, you can follow me on my social medias. You can find the ats here and in the description. But that's all, folks, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye! Simbib, stuff I make because I'm bored. If there was ever a time for VFX to unionize, it would be now. Best of luck, soldiers.